I enjoyed that song. I enjoyed that song. Even though if you, if you don't get to see the video, like Ed said, you get to hear the words. And I enjoyed that song. It just, it goes in very well with what I've been uh, teaching you the times I've been here. Romans chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans chapter 8. Uh, we have two more, two more teachings in Romans chapter 8. It talks about a confident redemption. Being confident that once I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, I have his redemption. You know, and Paul, the great apostle teacher, uh, has also established for us that, you know, right off the bat, first four verses, there is no condemnation. Once I receive Jesus Christ, take him as my Savior, walk with him daily, then I am confident of my redemption through his blood. And uh, I, I guess I'm on, right? I'm kind of getting looks out there. I hope I'm on because you guys know me well enough now, I move around a lot. I'm turned on up here, Randy. I can probably talk loud enough you're going to hear me anyhow. Okay? Two things. You need to be a, a pastor, gift a gab and a big mouth. And I've got them both, so it's not a problem. Okay? All right. So as we're looking at this, we've already realized there's no condemnation in the forgiveness and grace that Jesus Christ gives us when we ask Him for it. And we've also learned that uh, we have the Holy Spirit that also helps us. In our, hey, there we go. Somebody found the right button. That helps us in our walk with the Lord. And we also have the confidence that once we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, God adopts us into our family. We've already learned that. And then we've learned that we have a confident hope waiting for us in eternity. And that this confident hope has led us to a confident glory. And through that glory that is awaiting us in heaven, we know that that glory far outweighs anything, any suffering, any persecution, anything that we will go through here on earth. So now, what we want to look at today from Romans chapter 8, we want to look at verses 26 through 30. Because the, the Holy Spirit and this confidence of knowing God's glory and the confidence of an eternal hope in heaven also is very viable and very real for our lives here today. We can know it today. You know, for the child of God, heaven is as close to hell as he or she will ever get. I said that wrong. Excuse me, I need to back up. I said that wrong. For the child of God, earth is as close to hell as we will ever get. And for those who will not accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, earth is as close to heaven as that person will ever get. But while we are walking here on earth, uh, how, many, how many veterans do we have here? Veteran? You remember boot camp? Loved it, didn't you? Yeah, I, I, I went through 10 weeks of boot camp. And after the 10th week, I realized I do have another name other than the names I was called. Yeah. And, and we look at that, and it's the same way with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at this this section this morning, these few short verses, and realize that when I consider God's current work, what God is doing in me, and put it along 
side the accomplishment that Jesus has already acquired for us in heaven, then I can realize I have tremendous hope in this life. That's all right. That screen's better looking than I am anyhow, so it'll be fine. And, and, and as we go walk here on earth, we're kind of like in boot camp. And one thing about boot camp that I soon learned, <laughs> I didn't know it all. I had an idea what it was going to be like to be in a military boot camp, but I didn't know it all. And I realized that other than calling me a lot of names that my mother ever expected and never expected me to be called was not just part of the, the drill instructor's duty, but being my aid and help through boot camp was part of his duty. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not just something or someone that's out there. The Holy Spirit is a person, the third part of the Trinity, that enables me to walk through this world now and realize the confident redemption, the confident hope, the confident glory that I can have now as well as that that is awaiting me in heaven. So as we look at that, uh, we're just going to go right down through the verses this morning. Uh, now, I'm throwing you a curveball. I've got a Bible here this morning, but it is the message. The message. It's a translation that makes a lot of sense about what we're going to look at and discover this morning. So, take your Bible. You can still follow along in any Bible. That's all right. There's, this, this, it's just going to be worded a little bit different. It's simple because I'm a simpleton and I like things simple. Okay, beginning at verse 26. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs and our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. He knows our pregnant condition, and I like that word pregnant, and I'm going to share with you why here in a little bit, and keeps us present before God. Let's just stop right there with verses 26 and 27. These verses solidify the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Why He is here. What His purpose is. Why it is so important that we submit to His control. And you know, sometimes I can have a tendency to be slightly bullheaded. If Sue was here, she'd be screaming, Amen, to the rooftop, man. And when I was in boot camp, I was 18 years old, you know, had the world by the seat of the pants with a downhill pool, you know, and everything was going well. I had it together. I knew what I was going to do in the Air Force once I got through boot camp and all that stuff. But boy, did I get turned around in a hurry. You know, when the DI stood up there that very first morning that he had 54 of us in a room a little bit smaller than this room sitting on the floor and he looked at us all and he said for the next 10 weeks I will be your God I wasn't a Christian then you know didn't really know anything about salvation but I thought no this guy isn't going to control me and we do that same thing with the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been around since the creation of time and even before. You know, you look in Genesis chapter 1, it says the Spirit was over the land or over the world of that time. He was there, always has been there. He just hasn't taken part of my life or taken a part in my life until I allowed him to do that. 
Well, up until then, I was under conviction and, and had guilt feelings about things I'd said or, or terrible things I had done, but I didn't really know who or what was doing that to me. But now I did. Once I gave my life to Jesus Christ and asked Him to forgive my sins and come in and take over my heart. But I still battled with Him. I wish I could say that after I got saved, I did everything Jesus wanted me to do. <laughs> no, I, I didn't. There were still times I thought I had the best answer. You know, and there were times when, when I lay awake at night or I would awaken in the middle of the night and, and I would sit up in bed and something would be on my mind. Normally it, it was a, a, the life of a person or, or maybe a situation, a, a work situation. And I thought, I have no idea what's going to happen. That's why the first thing we find out in verse 26 is the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. I had my first great experience of Holy Spirit interception about a year after I became a Christian. I'd heard messages and teachings on the Holy Spirit, but I was driving from Clarion County to Cambria County. I was leaving my home, which is about 10 miles from here, and going to a little place called Blandburg, which was about 100 miles. And working an 11-hour shift and driving back home. And I was getting physically and emotionally exhausted. And I left my house one morning about 3.15, and I got about oh, two, two and a half miles down the road. And all of a sudden, I open my eyes, and my little Volkswagen is sitting in a snowbank. To this day, I have no idea how it got there. I don't know if I fell asleep. I just awoken up. You know, so <laughs> I didn't, I, or or I, the roads had snow and packed ice on them, or did I slide off the road? I don't know. All I know was I opened my eyes. I'm sitting there with my hands on the steering wheel. The motor's running, and I've got snow halfway up my door. So I shut the Volkswagen off, roll down the window, crawl out the window, and walk out onto the road. I walk back to the house, wake up Sue, we take my four-wheel drive truck down in a chain, we pull the Volkswagen out of the snowbank, it's sitting on the road, and I sat down in the middle of that road, and I just bawled, and bawled like a baby. I said, "Hun, i I'm losing it. I said, I don't know how this happened. And it scares me. I need some help. Be praying for me. And she told me, she says, when you come home tonight, you go to Pastor Mike's house. Mike Duty was a pastor of the Oakland Church of God at the time. I said, you go to his house. I'll have you clean clothes there. You can shower there. And I'll bring you in some food and then we can go to church. It happened to be on a Wednesday. <laughs> of all things, you know. So I did. And while I'm eating, I showered up and while I'm sitting there eating before church started, Mike started talking to me about the Holy Spirit. He says, Donald, when he called me Donald, I knew something, something was coming. He says, Donald, you need to submit to the presence of the Holy Spirit because you don't have the strength physically, emotionally, and spiritually to keep on doing this. Now, I think that's the first Wednesday night church service I was ever in where I had an altar call. <laughs> 
And I was the only one at the altar. <laughs> but I wanted the Holy Spirit to take over my life. Why? Because the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Paul says, in our heavy sighs and in our groanings. Now, that doesn't mean that, that I'm going to go down to the altar and grumble and growl and make unintelligible things. No, it means the groanings of my heart. The times I wake up in the middle of the night and all of a sudden someone's name pops into my mind that I need to contact that person or say a prayer for that person. Or maybe it's a situation that, 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 that I'm going through that, that all of a sudden the Lord wakes me up, the Holy Spirit wakes me up. I came to realize that I don't always know how to put into words everything that I want to take to the Lord in prayer. And I don't always voice the heaviness that's upon my heart. I don't always ask for help. Now if I ask most ladies out there that have husbands, I would ask you, is your husband very good and readily asking for help when he needs it? In most cases it would be, are you kidding? You know, that's, it's a guy thing I guess. But it's also a lady thing too. They don't always ask for help when they need to. But the Holy Spirit had interceded for me. Now did he cause me to drive into the snowbank? I don't know. I was uninjured. I still showed up at work like only 15 minutes late. And for the next year and a half I never had another incident of driving. Never had an accident, never had a blowout. Hit a deer once. Well, either he hit me. He jumped the fence and landed on the hood of my Volkswagen. So, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. And that's what Paul's telling us. And, and, and not only that, why does he intercede for us? Well, look, he does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of wordless sighs and aching hearts. And then look at the next one. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. He knows our pregnant condition and keeps us present before God. That's the second thing the Holy Spirit does. Right now, this day, when we allow him and give him permission to do so, he keeps us in the presence of God on a continual basis. We don't have the physical emotions or spirituality to do that on our own on a constant basis. But the Holy Spirit keeps us in the presence of God. Now what do I mean by that? Okay. Pregnant condition. I have four children. And Sue's pregnancies, with all four of them, were different, except for one thing. She would be sitting there, watching television, or maybe at the meal table, or maybe just working around the house, and she'd start crying. And in all the wisdom of a man, what are you crying about? You ladies are smiling because you know what the answer is. I don't know. But as a guy, I could fix it. Just tell me what the problem is. I just want you to sit here and hold me and let me cry. And in my mind, I think that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But we just said she just needed a silent presence you know and we're like that with the Holy Spirit we always remember I, I think I shared with you the newspaper reporter Christian we have to know who what when where and why and how we, we have to know all those things you know before we're satisfied when all we need is a silent presence of God and sometimes we lose that silent presence 
But the Holy Spirit is there to draw us back into the silent presence of God. And I'm glad He does. Because I'm still not real good about asking for help. And I'm still not real good about always thinking I have to fix it. But the longer I've walked with Him, especially in the lives of people, you know, when someone says, Pastor, would you come and visit me? You need to talk to my husband. You need to tell him he needs to get saved. I said, well, have you told him that? I said, yeah. I said, then why would I want to tell him what he already knows? I sit there and talk with him. We'll drink coffee, whatever, you know. Tell stories. He knows what he needs to do. Especially if you and your family members have told him that. What I'm going to do, I'm going to tell him, I'm going to say, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit tears you apart. Man, I get looks like, is that a good prayer? Oh yeah. When the Holy Spirit tears you apart, it's a great prayer. It's a heavenly prayer. You know, and, and, and He not only intercedes for us, but He keeps us present in the presence of God. When maybe we're not doing... You know, I, I wish I could say that I've walked with the Lord with all the wisdom of God. Pfft. No. And, and, and how do I know that the Holy Spirit is interceding in my life? How do I know that the Holy Spirit is trying to draw me closer to God? First thing, conviction. Have you ever did something that you know you shouldn't have done and then a time later you're convicted by it? When I was working night shift for C&K Coal Company and I'm out in no man's land doing reclamation work running a double nine bulldozer out there all by myself for 11 hours and I would start thinking about something that I had said to maybe one of my children or something that I had did that wasn't real nice, lost my temper, yelled at them, you know, probably cussed at them because I could make sailors blush back in those days. And, or maybe something I'd said to a friend and I'd just start crying. You know, I'd just stop that machine and say, what in the world is going on here? Why am I sitting here crying at 3 o'clock in the morning? Because the Holy Spirit was convicting me. And I didn't find that out until I gave my heart to the Lord. This was going on in summer, spring and summer of 1977 into the fall. Sue got saved in June of 77. And she started having... Uh, uh, 15, 20 women coming to the house to do a Bible study. All they do is just interrupt my time. You know, these women be in there and they'd bring food and they're sitting around and they're reading their Bibles and they're doing these Bible studies. And then the next thing, I, you know, I'd look in the window and we had, because we had big windows. If you know where I used to live, it's below Pastor Doug's house, that house right down over the hill from him. It has big windows, six by eight foot windows in it, the whole way around living room, game room, and all that stuff. And uh, I'd look in there, and they're down there, and they're, they're on their knees, and they're praying, you know, and they've got their hands folded. I said, this is a great time to fire up the lawnmower and start mowing the light yard. Either that or I'd cut firewood. They were interfering on my time. Well, after I gave my heart to the Lord, Sue brought that up to me. She says, you know what we were praying about? And I said, no. She said, your salvation. And then the Holy Spirit started convicting me. Whew. And we, we'd left church. You know, and, and then we, she, she and the kids started going to distant church of God. And I'd say, because of how the church I was at was treating one another, I said, if that's Christianity, I don't need it. I don't have any time for it. But it led me to get saved. Conviction. You know, we'll do that. Uh, confused emotions. 
<sighs> I was so messed up. You know, feeling this way, feeling that way. Had no idea why I was thinking about this. It was none of my business and I didn't care anyhow. But it was still on my mind. The Holy Spirit intercedes and the Holy Spirit draws us back into the presence of God. And then another thing that the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit intercedes for them who are united with Christ. One of the misquoted verses is verse 28. Romans 8, 28. This, this doesn't say it very well, but probably most of you know it. All things work for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. Sometimes we tell that to people who are, don't even know Jesus Christ. Sometimes they don't, may not even believe in God. And we tell people that. That is so wrong. That verse is meant for one group of people. Those who love the Lord. The only thing the Holy Spirit is going to do for those who don't know Jesus as Savior as Lord is confuse them and convict them and tear up their emotions. I went through it. But for those that have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, the worst thing in the world that could ever happen to you will work for your good in your relationship with God. Now don't ask me how it does. I can't answer that. No two people are the same. God works in mysterious ways. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1.5 says that when you were in the womb I had a plan for you. Before you were born, I knew you and called you to be a prophet. Think about that. So I'm not going to stand up here and say, I know what God has in store for you. I know what God's will is for your life. I, I, I don't. But the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will unite us with God because of our relationship with Him. Verse 28 is for the children of God. So we shouldn't be throwing it out there until we know what the person's relationship with God is because we'd be sharing an untruth with them. Other than the fact, I will tell them, the Holy Spirit, I hope He tears you up. I hope he makes you so miserable you don't have any place to go but to Jesus. I mean, that's what he did in my case. And maybe some of you have stories like that too. But that's what the Holy Spirit does. He, he places us in his love covenant with Jesus. And he wants us to unite with him in that covenant. And to live out that covenant on our day-to-day -day basis. And it's tough. You know, I don't always make wise decisions in the Lord. You know, I, I, I've been outright disobedient at times. Thank the Lord as I draw closer and closer and closer. And His love becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Those times become less and less and less. And I thank the Lord for that. I thank the Holy Spirit for that. But that's, that, that, that's what happens. You know, he wants us to become more and more like Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 deals with our minds. He wants us to have the mind of Christ. He wants us to think like Jesus thought. How did Jesus think? Read the red letter words if you have them in your Bible. Those are the thoughts and the actions of Jesus. And then, and then you go into uh, the Philippians. The whole short book of Philippians talks about what we are to do with our attitudes. When we draw closer to God, our thinking stops stinking. And we start thinking more like Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what, that's a good thing. Very good thing. And then, l l listen, th this is... 
Colossians 2.20 We are no longer, it is no longer me living, but Jesus living in me that people are saying. I love that story. That just exemplified Colossians 2.20 if he's bigger, if he's in us and he's bigger in us, shouldn't people be able to see him? Amen. They sure should. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, that is what happens with us. Now, let's, let's finish it out verses 29 through 30. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made the decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun. Now, in some of your translations, it may talk about selection, election, or predestination. Predestined. I heard a preacher say this in a church that I was attending. I was not a Christian. I had gone to hell in a heartbeat. But the preacher stood up and said, There are some that are predestined to be saved and some that are predestined not to be saved. That's false. All of us are predestined to have the choice to choose Jesus Christ as Savior. Only God knows those who will not do it. That means for me, I need to be telling everyone about the grace, forgiveness, and love of Jesus Christ. Because I don't know. There used to be a Christian song out several years ago. I think it was called The 15th Time or something like that. I don't even know who sung it. It was a contemporary Christian song. But it talked about witnessing. That sometimes it takes maybe 15 times of good testimony before someone receives Jesus Christ. And we don't know when we're testifying or witnessing someone if that wouldn't be the 15th time. So that's the importance of doing. You know, and God, God has chosen us. You know, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we receive a spiritual gift from the Holy Spirit. And if you read in Ephesians and Romans and 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, you can see about all the different kinds of spiritual gifts. But we get a spiritual gift from God. You know, I can't go to a college and learn one, like I've heard some pastors say. But God gives me that. In other words, He elects me, He selects me, He chooses me to do something and gives me a gift with the ability to do that. For me, it was a gift of teaching. That gift hasn't changed in almost, in, in almost 40 years. And quite frankly, I don't want it to change. I like teaching God's Word. Some, He gives the gift of healing. Now, I'm not saying that there are those that can lay on hands and heal people. That doesn't heal people. The prayers of God's righteous people bring healing. I've seen an exorcism. The young man who prayed over the possessed person did not remove that demon. His faith that God would remove that demon removed it. Scared me to death. And I'm glad I didn't get that gift from God. And all these other kinds of gifts that are out there. Kindness. The gift of, of hospitality. Everything is out. We receive gifts. 
And the Holy Spirit, when we allow Him to control us, controls that gift and helps us to use it to the glory of God. But not only that, those that we use those gifts with benefit also. I don't believe the doctor healed you. But I believe God used that doctor to heal you. Just like I had no reason why I was crying and boo-hooing around and thinking of all this weird stuff, my family and stuff at night. But after I got saved, I knew that God's Holy Spirit was selecting me. And then I believed that God was going to take me into the ministry. I wasn't sure. So I went to Pastor Mike and I said... Mike, I think God wants me to go in the ministry. He says, well, what kind of things can you do? I said, well, I was a farmer. I worked for a carpenter contractor. I've sold insurance. Uh, I was in the Air Force. I could probably learn a foreign language. I, I learned a couple languages while I was over in Italy. You know, and, 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 you know, I can do a lot of things. He said, okay, I'll pray with you. So for the next year, I probably asked him three or four times because the yearning was in my heart. And he always asked, well, what can you do? And I'd tell him. Finally, after about a year of this going on, he went over there and I said, Mike, I really think God's calling me into the ministry. Well, what can you do? I've already told you everything I can do, but the only thing I want to do is serve God. You have been called, Donald. That's how the Holy Spirit worked. I just had to say, all I want to do is serve God. And then he selected me. He predestined me to become a preacher. Little did I realize that I would be coming back to my hometown area and teaching people the Bible. Because I still get people look at me and say, Nope. Don Jeffords, a preacher? Mm, nope. Mm, mm. I can't see that. Well, I say, That's all right. Jesus wasn't accepted in his hometown. I can live with it too. You know? But most of them, you know, they, they knew me when. So when you look at that, you know, that's this whole idea of predestination. We do not know who is going to accept Jesus or who is never ever going to accept Jesus. Only God knows. So I can't afford to take a chance of not witnessing to everyone I get the chance to witness to. And then as, as, as we look at this, the last point I want to share with you the Holy Spirit leads us into exemplifying the presence and power of Jesus Christ in our lives. And then, after getting them established, He stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what He had begun. And the whole purpose of a Christian is to exemplify Jesus Christ. Letting, him, letting everybody know what a friend we have in Jesus. That'd be a cool song to do sometime, Thomas. You know? And, and, and when we look at that, that's what he wants us to do. You know, since creation, God has had me on his mind. And since that fateful morning, when I car ended up in a snowbank, had no reason, had no idea how it got there, was totally confused, scared, crying, saying, I need help. And then that night at a Wednesday night Bible study, I asked the Holy Spirit to take over my life. I'd been screwing it up enough. I needed some expert help. And He took over my life. I wish I could tell you that I always followed his leading, but I haven't. But it keeps getting less and less of me and more and more of him as the years go by. That's the confidence 
we have of our redemption through Jesus Christ. That's the confident hope we have today and for eternity. That's the confident glory we can talk about and share today and that glory we will live in for eternity. That's the confident adoption that I am one of God's children. And as I close out this teaching this morning, I want to leave you with a question. And I'm just going to read it. Am I asking the Holy Spirit to guide my life into God's redeeming glory and hope for eternity? That's the question you must answer. Not with words, but with your life and its actions in this time, this day and age. And if ever, ever people needed to see Christians living the glory and hope of Jesus Christ. It is today in all the mess that our country is in. And not only that, in our prayers. In our prayers. Father, thank you, Lord, for today. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. And I just thank you, Lord, for the message. I, I pray that uh, it, it'll make a change in our lives. And Lord, as we leave here this day, May your Holy Spirit go with us. And Lord, if there is someone here today that has not asked the Holy Spirit to take control of his or her life, may this be the day. This is the day that the Lord has brought. We shall rejoice and receive him and take his Spirit into us and be glad of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.